All right, I'd like to welcome everybody and their penguins to this workshop. Um, we have a, um, a really great show for you today. Some new strategies. If you were here for the previous workshop on how to draw our tuxedoed friends, um, then um, there's, there's actually some new information that will be coming your way, which will make the whole thing a lot more fun. Um, we also have our two uh, guests today. Um, and uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm first going to um, introduce you folks um, to, to, to Marsha Sivek, the um, host of Be Provided uh, Conservation Radio. And um, it's a really great podcast um, that interviews lots of people, people doing cool conservation projects all around the globe. And, um, and she's going to be introducing, uh, who introduced me to, to, to Pablo, um, and um, she will be introducing our special, our special, special guest today um, uh, from the, the Global um, Penguin Conservation Society. So, Marsha, thank you so much for being with us today, um, and welcome. Oh, thank you, and thank you so much for doing this again, Jack. I really appreciate it. So, um, so yeah, so I'm really just here to give a brief introduction to uh, Pablo Garcia Borbo Roglu. I introduced him, um, well, I also call him Poppy, so you may hear us interchange that name back and forth, but um, <laughs> I interviewed Poppy probably about a month ago now about, and we had a great discussion about penguins and the health of the ocean. So if you get a chance and wanna learn some more, you can, you can also, listen to that podcast on my website, which Melinda posted in the chat, but you can also look at his website, which he'll talk about as well. So Poppy is the founder of the Global Penguin Society, and we have his grandmother to thank for sharing her wonderful story <laughs> about penguins in Argentina to him as a child. So now he can share the stories of penguins and the health of the ocean with everybody like us around the world. So thank you so much and welcome, Poppy. Thank you so much, Marcia. And thank you, John, for, for inviting us to share our passion for penguins. And uh, I'm, really, I'm really excited because this is a, a new thing for me. I mean, I, I've never done a Zoom where people can learn, even myself, I'm looking forward to learning. <laughs> So I'm, I, right now I'm in Patagonia, in the southern part of Argentina. We are in the winter now. Uh, it's very cold right now. This is penguin land by definition. Uh, and uh, as Marcia mentioned, uh, I am the founder and director of the Global Penguin Society. Uh, it is an uh, international organization that pr promotes the protection of all the species of penguins that exist on the planet. There are 18 different species of penguins. They are all on the southern hemisphere. They don't fly. The issue is that we want to protect them because over half of them are listed as threatened by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. This is because they face threats when they are in the ocean, like fisheries or climate change and marine pollution, but also when they come on land. And they come on land only to raise, to breed uh, their chicks. And they are affected by human disturbance and the introduction of predators. So through science uh, and management of their habitats to protect marine habitats and coastal habitats, and also through education, we promote the protection to benefit penguins, but also to benefit the communities that coexist with penguins, and many of them depend on ecotourism. You know? It's part of their livelihoods. And also protecting penguins, protecting the oceans, we will benefit, pe benefit people and also benefit the entire planet. So if you want to learn about us, uh, our uh, um, website is uh, globalpenguinsociety.org and you can look for us at Facebook or check on us on Instagram, Global Penguin Society, and also on Twitter. And uh, so I will be very happy to answer your questions and I'm looking forward to this class. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. Um, hold on one second, this is video. Um, so we will be uh, joining uh, Pablo again at the end of this workshop and um, we'll have an opportunity to ask uh, him uh, some questions. Thank you so much for being with us and um, our, our, 
uh, greatest, deepest gratitude and respect for the work that you are doing on behalf of, of conservation of the oceans and the animals that live within them. Um, it is critically important. I really see um, nature journaling, the art of paying attention to the world around us as, as a stepping stone to better conservation. And so a big part of my work in connecting people with the strategies of how to, to do nature journaling and to draw what we see is to deepen our appreciation of these species and then to lead us to, as you have, have devoted your life to, to, to conservation and stewardship. So thank you. Thank you very much for the work that you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm now going to uh, break into um, a little bit of work here on to, to help us be able to draw the penguins that uh, we now, as you mentioned, ecotourism. I actually think it made me start thinking about like, what would a penguin watching a uh, field trip look like? Um, we'll have to talk about that. Uh, that might be a really fun theme for a nature journaling um, <laughs> uh, big adventure. Um, so the, if you were here for the first class on drawing penguins, this content will be different than that. So uh, there's a little bit of overlap, but if you are, um, if you are, are really into drawing penguins, you might want to go back, check that class as well, and then we're going to, to dive in. So let me now go here to share a screen with you. And what we're going to do is just start with some penguin speed sketching. All right. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put I'm going to put some penguins up on the screen for you, and those penguins are going to only uh, be waddling before you for for just a moment. What I'd like you to do is as um, this is just fast lightning gesture sketching of, of penguins. So don't feel that you have to get in details and, and specifics, but you want to just, in this, just get your hand, your pencil moving as quickly as you can. You're going to have about, so this, this, this first one is going to be, we're going to have a few um, penguin sketches that we're going to do that will only be there for about 20 seconds. All right? So your goal, you ready? We're going to be speed sketching these penguins. So you want to get your journal out. You want to get ready. And this is just going to warm us up. Are you ready? I'd like to introduce you to penguin number one. Here it comes. There it is. Go for a quick sketch. Get your hand moving faster than that. I'm watching you. See, I can watch you through those little, uh, through the, 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 the monitor on your computer. You're going a little bit slow for this. For this, you want these to be just super loose and, and gesture sketches are, it's, it's, it's fast. You're not, trying, you're not trying to like get the exact shape of that wing. You're just trying to get the, the hunch, the feel of this thing. We're just warming up our brains. Ready? Here is penguin number two and three. Right, start with the one that's closest to you. Ready, go. Right, just get that shape down. Get that shape down. Use the basic simple forms that you think are going to capture its body the best. Could I hold some of those up? Right. Um, don't know if you can see this um, through the little inset. Um, Carolyn beside me has been doing some penguin sketching here. You see that it is just quick, loose lines. She's popped in a couple of angles, but she's getting curves and, uh, and, and basic, basic shapes, no detail. Now let's take that other penguin that's behind it, drop it in behind your first penguin. Two overlapping penguins, All right? Yeah, multiple, multiple circles. I often start with circles and then kind of crisp those up by finding lines and angles. So first kind of massing in forms, then finding a few places where there are straight lines and edges. Carve those in and make your penguin happy. All right, 
So first, just start by blocking in the basic shape. And then what I really want you to do is to pay attention to the, um, the negative spaces, the angles around the penguin. What is the angle underneath the throat to the shoulder there? What is the angle going up the beak to the forehead? So start with those big bubble drawings, zoop, 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 zoop. Then carve in some of those angles. Shorten the beak. Yeah, I'm watching you. While you're doing this, I want to send a shout out to uh, Vivek Canzode and birdpixel.com, website where I got all these photographs from. Um, thank you so much for letting us use these. You too can go there to practice your penguin and other bird drawings. This one's about to waddle away. Make sure you've got that negative space underneath the throat that little angle underneath the throat. Angle on the forehead, angle throat to shoulder. Thank you, penguin. Ah, oh, look at that. Go for it. Look up, get some shapes and forms in your head. This is one where you can really kind of get yourself to bounce back and forth between kind of, you know, drawing ovals to block in the mass of something and then cutting in angles with looking at negative shapes. There's a wonderful negative shape underneath the, the head here. There's a wonderful negative shape underneath the wing. So instead of looking at that wing as the shape, the positive shape that I'm drawing, I would really look at that space underneath the wing and, and get that. And last one. Tails up, everybody. Some really fun negative shapes. Actually, I'm just going to pause your pencil for just a moment and notice, just kind of gaze at this picture. And notice that as you do, you'll see that when you look at the blue sky behind the penguin, you can see the contours of the penguin better. So when I'm drawing, I'll initially start by drawing some ovals, blocking those in. Then I'm just gazing at those negative shapes, carving in those negative shapes. I want to get that lean. All right. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to a different shared screen. And um, we're going to, um, I'll put up a picture and I'll be drawing along with you. And we're going to look at just a few strategies to help you kind of get these shapes and, and handle some um, penguin esque forms. So let's go. Here. All right. There we go. So you see in the middle of the screen here, um, I've got a photograph of a skull of a Magellanic penguin. Little penguin, hello, little penguin, down here on the bottom of the screen. And what I um, am going to do is I'm going to draw on top of this skull so we can just sort of start to put some, some, some meat on and sort of think of a relationship to there being, there being actual structure underneath all this cuteness. All right, so let's take that skull and make it a little bit more faded out. All right, and now, here we go. Let's start by looking at looking at the, the, the bill shape here. Um, here we go. So the bill, it curves down to a point. This species has a fairly thick 
grill um, top to bottom. Others, you'll, as you saw in some of those slides, much more, much more faint. Oh, uh, wait, hold on, Amelia, when, let's, if you can't be on top of the keyboard there because then it makes weird things happen on my screen. Okay, we're good. Um, so, here we go. Um, now, how do I, I sort of come up with a sort of strange, okay, here we go. Um, So um, the beak here attaches into the face. Um, there's going to be, if you look at the photograph on the side, there is a, sw a swoop of feathers in here. There's also a curve of feathers in on the bottom. All right. If we think about this beak three-dimensionally, it actually has a thickness along the top and you're sort of seeing the base of it here. If I kind of make this a little bit more of a box, you can imagine the little sort of triangle of a flat top like that on top of the beak. And the middle of that being right about there. Because this is a three quarter view, I am going to, I'm gonna sort of build um, up the head, the far side of the head I can sort of see, we're gonna go up a little shelf of bone right here. So I'm drawing a little sloping platform, a little triangular sloping platform right there. Um, that is a little bit of penguin forehead sticking up. And then, Behind that, I'm going to widen out and I'm putting a box top on top of this penguin. So the center line of this would come up here and would go back like that. Now the eye is big and it occupies this large orbit. They actually have a huge eye. Um, but most of that is sunk back inside the head. Because they are, they're doing a lot of fishing in low light conditions, they need a, a really big, very, very, very good eye that works with low light. But to protect that eye, most of it is not visible to you. So inside there, that big head, there is a, um, there is a, there's, there's a big eye back there. But what you're seeing, is only a small part of that. And I'm gonna give this eye just a little bit of kind of pointy corner like you might see on a human being. But I'm not drawing, I'm not drawing, you know, the uh, 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 people with big whites of the eye like you would get with a human being. There's a little bit of tissue that is going to kind of come up around that. So very often if you just give a sort of a little bit, kind of makes your penguin look a little bit more sleepy, but giving a little bit of eyelids just makes this eye fit into your head a little bit better. So that whole eye is going to fit onto a side of a plane on the side of the head here. And Lastly, my chin, I'm going to imagine that as a plane coming up here and then changing angle and going back there. So that's sort of the cubist penguin head. If I fluff this into my, um, my, my, my body here um, or add just a little bit of fluff back here, my on the back of the head is where my spine would be coming out. So I can kind of pooch this out a little bit back here. So I'll do it a little bit back like that. So thinking about the heads of these as surfaces with planes is really going to, 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 to help you. So again, here's plane number one. 
right? Um, it just kind of coming up here as a little forehead. That's just going to help us carve, carve our birds a little bit better. Make it look better like this. Come on here. All right. Now, if I'm wrapping patterns over this head, I want to think of this angular structure as underneath, going on underneath the drawing that I'm doing. So if I've got patterns on the forehead, then coming up from the middle of the beak here, that V on the top of the head, it's going to meet in the middle going up that forehead and then around and over the side of the, the face. But you see how I am you're kind of going up over this little lip right here. And you want to think of that as having an initial little shelf here and then coming out over the top of the head. So a really good way of kind of turning the head of the bird towards you just a little bit is to look for, I've got a little bit of penguin head sticking out this side. I'm going to pay attention to what's going on right there with that angle um, where it connects down to the forehead. That's going to really help place my bill in the head and make this whole thing feel like it is, um, it is, um, here, let me take that off. We're discovering that wearing uh, tuxedos, um, um, is, uh, it's a little bit hot. But for the sake of fashion, I'm going to persevere over here on my end. Um, so just think of all these things as wrapping around a curved form. So as you're coming in and tucking this chin in, instead of, watch this, instead of here's the edge of my bird, instead of that coming in like that, I want to come in and hook it up. See how that hooks up there? That gives you the effect The effect, um, the effect of that, that head turning into the, the body there. If you had taken that and come down straight like that, that's what that curved line would do on a flat object. But this is no flat object. It's a penguin, right? Its body is turning away from us. So I'm hooking that up here. You can see that hook up here. So this area right here, this area right here really helps turn the form. Not just a penguin lesson, that's a lesson that you can use in, in anything that you are drawing. Let's now take a look at a drawing of a penguin. All right. Um, I'm going to start by just thinking about sausage shapes. We mentioned this before in the previous workshop. Um, hold on, my, oh, I see what's going on. I want, here, All right? Um, in the previous workshop, we, we made some sausages. And what I suggest you do is to, on your piece of paper, just to draw a sausage and think of it that if we're looking at the end of it, the end of that sausage is right up here. It's pointing towards you a little bit. A line that curves around that sausage is going to come like that. Essentially, if you could see through the sausage, you'd be seeing an oval like that. So if I were to see through this sausage, I'd be seeing around it like that. Here's the side of the sausage that is the closest to me, All right? And in drawing penguin bodies, it's a great opportunity to, f to get, get us, ourselves to think about drawing things in a way that will be three-dimensional. So in order to draw something that looks like it's got three dimensions to it, you need to visualize it in three dimensions. If it is in straight side view, right, um, and you're looking at it straight on, 
these circles are going to be straight lines going across it. But um, you want to think of like the one right, that's right at the height of your eyes, that would be a straight line. But one that's even a little bit below that, you're going to be looking down on that a little bit. So you'll see a little bit of a curve and a little bit more of a curve there. If you're looking down on the entire penguin, then all of those would be curved lines. Because these guys are really short, a lot of pictures you'll see of penguins are taken a little bit from above, but photographers often like to get down at eye level with the subjects that they have. So you'll see very often photographers will hunker down in the snow and they'll get themselves at, at, at eye level with their subject. Um, so let's just look at how I would go about drawing this. <clears throat> what I do when I look at an object is I first notice the shape of the air behind its back, right? And so this, there's a little bit of a turn up, a little bit more like this, and then there's an angle of the body there. I'm going to put in an oval an oval for the body, All right? And that oval for the body, and I'm going to think of that as a rounded, rounded form. That oval is sitting with, inserting on top of it, is a little bit of a cone, an upright cone. So I want to think of there's an upright cone right here on top of my oval for the body. And that cone, again, we see as a rounded form. And sitting on top of the cone is a ball for my head. It's not cone like this with ball like that. The ball sticks out in front. So I've got a little bit more ball sticking out in front. The beak is coming in closer to the top. My wing, you want to think of where it attaches to the body. It's going to be attaching up in here, coming down. Front edge is curved. You'll see very often right in about this point right here on the wing, sometimes you'll get a really neat angle change right in there. So it's not just a curve like that. Very often it's coming out straight and then gets steeper down. For the back part of our penguin here, I'm gonna think of this as a little three-dimensional pad of tissue, penguin rump sticking out here. The legs are really cool. If I add uh, some, some detail to this photograph, the leg comes up to a point in here. There's a heel. All right. There is a, coming up to about here, there is its shin bone and its hip bone is going back like that. So there actually is a knee that's hidden somewhere back in there. So what you're seeing is sort of thigh bone mass coming down here. And then the toes are on the ground. So this is a shortened, this is that um, tibia fibula fused together that you see in, in other birds, you imagine if you're drawing another bird, here's a little sparrow, tweet, tweet. You often see the leg coming down like that with that toes on part of it. This part of the leg that you see right there, that is equivalent to this little short stub right there. So there's just a little short stub of that with our penguin foot flat on the ground. So what I'm doing here as I'm carving this penguin is I'm really getting myself to think about it three-dimensionally. Nice work. All right. Goodbye, little penguins. Let's take a look 
Oh, not at you. Um, at another little penguin, all right? One more in sort of a static side view. No, I think you guys are ready for, this is basically lessons that are very similar to what we just did. Um, let's jump over this penguin, which is just sort of same thing in a side view, just but, but imagine how you would go about drawing this form. There's that big oval there. I mean, well, may, maybe there's, there's one thing that's worth mentioning on this little guy right here. Um, nope, I don't want that. I want, um, is that if you're at, again, at eye level right here with this penguin, let me change colors. If I'm at um, eye level with this penguin here, then um, as I'm looking down on the body here, I am, you know, here would be sort of the next layer. Looking down here, this circle of this body here is going to be much more open than this one. You're looking down through these and then towards the bottom here, imagine if this penguin was sitting on a dinner plate. You'd see much more of the, the, the face of that plate. So just as you are envisioning these circles, you can let those circles right at eye level, the circles like that, a little bit below that, like that, a little bit below that, the circle gets progressively more open. So you're really looking at something that down at the base, imagine if there's a dinner plate right here on the ground, you'd be, you could see what was on that plate. Up here though, it's the side view of that plate. This photographer got at eye level with the bird. Now, let's think three-quarter view. For this, we notice that we have a three-quarter view here on the head and a three-quarter view on the belly of this penguin. So we're going to start just the, 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 the same way that you, you, would, you would expect. On this penguin, I'm going to start just with the negative shape of the back of that bird. There's that kind of, that, that hunch, that lean. If I get that shape, then that is going to, that gesture, that gesture is gonna do a lot to kind of carve my penguin form. I'm then going to build that up with sort of a big bubble. And on that big bubble, I want to be thinking of that as three-dimensional penguin time. I'm going to have a ball for my head out here. And then I'm going to refine that with some negative shapes. So if I have a beak that is sticking out here, I have the negative shape going up the forehead. I have the negative shape coming down onto the chin and popping into the chest there. And then this area right here, those are some interesting negative shapes. So you're coming down over here. There's a corner and you're going down again. So I'd like to look for where are their corners on the penguin? Where are those corners? You want to identify those corners. Each one of those, if you pick it up in your drawing, you're going to be really sculpting this thing much more effectively. Then if I draw on top of my kind of non photo blue pencil or my kind of preliminary drawings, I can then start really thinking of, all right, I have a shape of a beak here. And that, the center line of it comes up here. I have my change in forehead here. 
And let's look at this black patch right on the forehead as a shape. It, if you looked at it from the front, it would come up evenly. But on this foreshortened form here, let's just follow the center line of this head up like that. The center of it is going to come through, cross over that center line. So do you see how I'm coming up to that line and then tucking down? I want to think of this line in the back as kind of coming across that center line, kind of flat across that center line, and then it's going to expand and do its thing. <clears throat> Probably want that eye a little bit higher, don't I? And lastly, on the, the head down here where it comes into the body, I'm going to hook it up and the center line is in here. So that low point of that thing, it's going to be right there on that, on that penguin zipper. So if we put a zipper on this penguin, it would come like that. There's the penguin zipper, right? So when it gets in its penguin suit, that's right where that, that center line is. All right. As artists, we're always keeping track of that zipper line, that center line. We want to imagine whatever patterns there is going to be symmetrical on either side of that. Let's take these lessons and apply it to a different bird. Two different birds this time. Take a look at, at, at these characters. Thank you for joining me. Amelia, is it alright if I later share some of your drawings with people? Great. Um, you have to go back to kids have to go back to their their regular school. Um, so let's on your piece of paper think about how you would how you'd structure this this uh, these these king penguins here. What are the basic shapes? Notice the zipper line. What are the guidelines that are going to help you be able to draw these forms? And let's block those in. Let's just take some time right now and do that. And then I will kind of walk through how I might approach it. But let's just start with how, how would you approach these penguins from the start? So if I were messing with that, that penguin that is the closest to us, I might look at that angle of the back as being sort of an initial gesture. Kind of head coming off like this. There's an angle of the back. And I put that in with fairly um, loose strokes.
then I am turning that into a sausage. I'm adding a ball to my sausage and and thinking of that little head off there as being attached to a little cone on top of my ball. Then I'm going to refine all of this business with my negative shapes. So I love looking at negative shapes where heads meet bodies. There's always kind of interesting subtleties of little angles in those areas. So for instance, in the front, it comes down straight, then a sharp turn out to a curve. Love that there's an angle up. The center line of this one, we're seeing the center line going down the middle of the head here, down this side of the head. It's going to trace along the back following those contours. And down here, it's going to jump and bump into this clump of uh, by the, 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 the tail. So it's going to come out on that little mass right there. So how do I know it goes here? Well, take a look here over on the, the side here. Notice how this on the photograph, this line comes up to a bump here. The top of that bump is in, is right at the top of the center line, is right in line with the center line. So there is one little hint there. I also see this little tail piece here as intersecting there. The top part of that would be um, right on the center line. So the tops of those lines help show me where that, that, that center line is. So that means that when I go about the business of drawing this beastie in, actually, let's, let's play with that little, um, the wing first. Isn't that cool how long that wing is? So the penguin powers itself through the water using its wings instead of kicking with its feet. And so it needs these, uh, essentially the penguin will fly through the water. Let's first attach the wing high enough on the body. If I look at this penguin on the side and I divide it into thirds, all right, this wing attachment is fairly high on the body. So there's a little attachment area. I want to just notice how far from the belly it comes in. So I want to kind of maybe start it there about that far in. There is an upper portion. It is then coming down straight and having a corner and turning the corner. So I'm seeing three sections on this. And what's happening underneath the, the, the skin and the, the, the feathers here is that right in here is where the bird's wrist is. So it has a manis or a hand in here. From that wrist, you are going down to a radius and ulna in here to a short little humerus in here. So is what's going on with the, <clears throat> the those, those pieces of mind. So when you're seeing three sections, you actually are relating to something anatomical that's happening beneath the hood for just a couple of subtleties of, of, of drawing in the details on this, something that's really gonna turn this penguin towards you is this line on the back comes up and then it 
right? So I want it to have a high point back here. My head of the penguin is then going to wrap around that. So that little spot in there, there's a lot that happens there and it ends up being really important for making this little penguin look right. Another thing that will really help it is that down here at this end, I want to think of this mass of tissue of the tail tucking in and attaching on in there. So those are just a, a few ways that this idea of seeing three-dimensionally using big blocks of shapes as well as um, angles. So the masses, the three-dimensional uh, masses, as well as the angles uh, and negative shapes can really help us be able to draw these penguins more easily and more accurately. Because the penguin has such a simplified form, drawing penguins is a wonderful place and way to get ourselves to focus on these sorts of details. And then what we can do is we can turn around and apply these lessons that we've learned in penguin land to everything else that we're drawing. So these same basic lessons in visualizing structure apply across the board to everything that we want to take our pencil or pen to. So there we have some fundamental strategies for how to handle this. What I'd now love to do is to join Marsha and um, Pablo again and to, um, to, to, to give us an opportunity to reflect on a bit of the work of the, um, the, the Penguin Conservation Society as, as, and the other work that you're doing to protect penguins and any other thoughts that you had about um, uh, that you thought would be relevant for this audience of, of enthusiastic, nature-loving um, uh, uh, people. So there's, you got to know that you're, this is, it's, it's, it's a warm house. So this is, the, you're, you're talking to people that really do appreciate nature. Um, let me kind of turn off my spotlight. And um, Marsha or Pablo, do you want to go first? I see Pablo, you've got yourself unmuted. Um, why don't I turn it over to you, sir? Okay, fantastic. I learned a lot. Thank you so much, John. <laughs> you know, I, many times I, when I try to draw something, I pay attention a lot to the details at the beginning, and then I get stuck there. <laughs> but also it was so interesting to pay attention to what you were mentioning about the structure of the bones, because we can tell like males from females, depending on the structure of the head and also the, the size of the bill. So that's very important for us as well. Oh, oh. Um, and I didn't do that bad. Like, I didn't do, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> that was a decent, a decent penguin. <laughs> and you know, when you were talking, I remember that, you know, some time ago there was a, a game, a, a, a game called Disney Club Penguin and it was run by Disney and a hundred million kids were playing online. And they were, when they were brainstorming about what animal they would select to make these kind of, you know, um, games and, and they selected the penguins because they were kind of easier to draw, you know, <laughs> for them instead of other animals. So that was a good, a good decision. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. So, <laughs> So I just want to mention something that you said at the beginning, one of the main, even though, I mean, we were trained, I was trained as a, as a researcher and we do science to find evidence. So what are the problems that pay, penguins are facing and how to come up with, decision, with solutions, you know, based on science. But overall, we need to increase the connection of people with, with nature. I mean, that's the beginning and the end of everything. And uh, we are trying to kind of, engage new audiences and that's why i think this artistic 
events are so important to because we have to inspire people through the emotions and uh, even though science is very important we need to show people what that science how does science make us all feel you know and connect people with the science but in other arenas so art is one of the one of, i think is the most important place where we can touch the emotions and engage new audiences like you're doing right now well, well thank you I, th that's a very solid penguin that you've got going on there you've obviously spent a lot of time <laughs> looking carefully at these animals um, <laughs> The, um, what are some ways that people in the, who are, you've got an audience here around the world. Um, some people live in places where, um, where they're sharing um, space with penguins and others are very, very far removed. We might see penguins at our local aquarium uh, or at a zoo. Um, if people were wanting to, um, to get involved with, uh, protecting and conserving uh, these birds. What would be some what would be some some strategies that you would suggest people t take so that we are we're, we're we're doing the the right things, making moves that make ecological sense and um, and have a bigger impact in terms of the conservation we could work we, the conservation impact that we can have. How might people be able to get involved with penguin conservation? Great, thank you for that. So, I mean, I think one of the key things that we learn with this pandemic is how connected the planet is, not only through the atmosphere, but also through the oceans. Uh, most people like penguins, but some people feel that they are far away. I mean, they live very far from the penguins, but we all need to understand that whatever we do, day, our daily decisions have, has a different for everybody, including penguins. Like, one of the key things that we need to do is to reduce the, we don't need to waste energy or resources. I mean, we don't, we cannot waste food or clothes or, or energy, light, water, because I mean, those resources are limited and everything we consume, it has a price for the planet. One of the, the lessons we learned is that with this pandemic is that we, abused of nature we abused nature and we did not respect the planetary limits we thought it was going to be for free it was we thought it was not going to have a price and we are paying the price now and uh, so one of the key things sometimes you live far away you you don't have access to sea penguins but you have to pay it to to keep in mind that whatever you do today like recycle reduce single-use plastic avoid single-use plastic i mean Every single year, we go with communities of kids to the penguin colonies to remove all plastics before they come. Those campaigns are called cleaning the house of the penguins. And you will be amazed to see that every single year we collect plastics over and over. They come from all over because the ocean is connecting everything in a good sense, but also in a bad sense. So reduce the consumption of plastics and also, as I said, of all the resources that we need because we need to learn how to coexist. Penguins can get what they want and what they need, and we also need, but we need to be a wise, wiser consumers. That's right. <clears throat> so one thing we, way we can do is with those decisions that we uh, make, um, also um, donations to the penguin conservation work that, that you're doing, that money goes directly to support the research and education work that we are doing. And also part of what you're doing is looking at, so some, some things can be addressed by kind of consumer decisions, right? But other things we need kind of unified global political action to make a difference. And you are also addressing some of, of those things. So by supporting an organization like yours, we're also helping coordinate global coordinated global political action for um, penguin and ocean conservation. Um, exactly. maybe, maybe just sort of say exactly. a little bit about that because on one level, um, you, you, listening to you has actually made me decide I'm going to revisit my personal plastic consumption and there are things that I can do that I actually know I can do to reduce that. And actually because of seeing you here today, I'm now making a vow to do that. 
But the, right. they, at another Excellent. level, there is the um, there is um, coordinating political action. Could you say a little bit about what um, you are trying to get done and uh, what would be helpful in those regards? Excellent. So. Uh, Penguins are perfect because they can open discussions about topics that are difficult, difficult to talk. Climate change, marine pollution, fisheries, oil, oil industries, human, you know, increasing human population. So through penguins, we can talk about many things and we, also, we can also in, engage politicians and decision makers. We realize that to protect penguins, we need to work locally to protect the place where they have the nest, but also globally because they use very wide areas. And also we protect the oceans and there's nothing more global than the ocean. <laughs> so we created the, an organization called, depends on a UCN, in the National Union for the Conservation of Nature. And it is the Penguin Specialist Group that has impact on, on international policy and national policy to regulate the illegal fisheries, to minimize the impact of oil industries and also about pollution, as, as, you, as you mentioned. So, of course, some actions can be done directly, what you decide, but other things can be done only if we get support from the people. Um, in the United States, uh, our kind of, we are a member of the, a partnership called a Wildlife Conservation Network. And when you donate to them, uh, to Global Penguin Society through them, we receive all the support. And with those funds, we've been able so far to protect 32 million acres of habitat for penguins. We have taken 6,500 kids that live close to the penguins, but they've never been able to see them. And we need those kids to value the penguins because they will decide about the future of the penguins. And we have benefited 2,400,000 uh, 400, penguins so far, thanks to the support because, as you know, this is a partnership. I am here, I have the penguins nearby, I can help them. But maybe you want to be part of this, and you can be part of that because this is a, a partnership. You know, this is, you know, in Argentina, we like soccer a lot, <laughs> like Messi. And so, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a teamwork. It's a teamwork, you know, right. and, and penguins represent how global the planet is, and we can all make a difference. Penguins represent how global the, the planet is, and we can make a difference. I think that is, those are really very powerful and very important words. Um, and um, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. What I'd like to do now is to open this up to um, if there are anybody um, that has um, questions for um, um, uh, Pablo or Marsha, um, uh, let's... Um, yeah, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, oh, could, could, could you uh, address those for, could, could you uh, highlight those yeah, for us? Yeah, you want me to read those? Um, um, yeah, let's. Okay, they're for Pablo. So one is from Anne um, Chadwick. She wanted to know how you can tell us, um, or can you tell us how climate change is hurting penguins? Great. So, you know, normally we tend to think that most penguins are, live on ice and on, in Antarctica. And this is because of Hollywood, you know, films and documentary films. But I, I would say that only four penguins are kind of linked to ice and Antarctica. The rest of them are temperate penguins. They don't like to be in the cold. They don't like the ice. So climate change is affecting, of course, temperate penguins because it is changing the, the pattern of formation and melting of the ice and the ice for those penguins are critical because they need the ice to breathe and also to feed, you know. But outside of Antarctica, the climate change is also uh, changing the availability of food. You know, penguins don't fly, as John mentioned, and um, it, they need the food to be close to the colonies because they, the parents, they have to get the food and come back, you know, and, and feed the chicks. If the climate change is moving the food away from the colonies, they cannot fly and cover that distance quickly. So they have to swim and takes longer and for them. And many times when they come back, the chicks are dead or they are dying. And this is in some cases the, causing the decline of those populations. Mm. Of course, climate change is also increasing heat waves and it's also increasing in some areas rainfalls in moments where chicks are uh, vulnerable. Chicks are not waterproof, you know, when they are very small. Heat waves, for, to give you an example, last year in January, January is our summer. 
Uh, we have a day of 44 degrees centigrade. I don't know Fahrenheit, sorry about that. It was very hot. And in only one afternoon, four, 240 penguins died. 200 healthy penguins died because they couldn't cope with the heat. And we are having more heat waves. Uh, and so that's, I would say, a new source of, of concern right now. So this is basically what climate change is doing. Mm. Wow. Okay. I have some more questions. Are you Great. ready? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So there is, here, I'll just take them in order. Hopefully I don't miss, miss some. Um, let's see. So how do you tell the males from the females, Jan asked. Yeah. Excellent. So it depends on the species. You know, as I say, there are 18. But for example, in the Magellanic that John uh, mentioned, that was definitely a male. The males, they have a thicker bill, you know, and longer bill. Of course, we measure them and we know, we measure thousands of penguins now, and now we, we can know that. In 80% of the cases, we can age, uh, sex them de de depending on the size, but we have a 20% that is not so clear, you know? Um, and, and, but in, in Magellanic penguins, we have, and that also applies to some other species of penguins. Uh, but of course, if you look at all of them, I mean, they all look the same, right? <laughs> That, that, there was a, just, sorry. That's good. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's cool. That's a bit more effective than shaking it and see if an egg falls out. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, so Paula Lopez, I believe she's also in Patagonia. Um, she would like to ask you, Pablo, about the possibilities of two different species penguins to reproduce. She read one time that maybe Humboldt and Magellanic penguins were able to have babies. So do they, can they intermix? Is that what she's, yes. Yep. Okay. Exactly, so there are four, four species of penguins that are, car, that are more related. They belong to kind of group. Those are the African, the Magellanic that lives here, the Humboldt that lives in Chile, and the uh, Galapagos penguin, you know, the tropical penguin we have. So those four belong to a group. And the, since they are very good um, res, uh, investigations, new research, about genetics, about penguins. And we are learning a lot now. Uh, what we know is that some species are kind of still separating. I mean, there's, 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 not, it's not still completely clear that it's a different species. You know, by definition, a species would not be able to, may, uh, to breed with another species, you know? But the Humboldt and the Magellanics, they overlap in Southern Chile, you know? Mm -hmm. And there are high, I mean, and you have pairs in which you have a, a humble and a Magellanic and they have chicks. So we have, ha we are having hybrids there because there's the separation of the species is still not defined yet. You know, that's what she mentioned. She's mentioning. Okay. Yeah. That's why you hear anywhere from 18 to 22 different species, right? I mean, you always, it's like exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. And then like the, to give you two cases, like the, the little blue penguin, which is 30 centimeters tall, and they live in Southern Australia or New Zealand. There's always this kind of thing about, there are two with a white flipper that lives in, white flipper blue penguin that lives in New Zealand, or there are one. And then recently genetic studies show that the macaroni penguin and the royal, they seem to be the same. So <laughs> we are ranging between 17 and 20. Right? We like, we try to say, okay, 18 now. <laughs> it's like, it would be like an exchange rate, you know, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> the penguin exchange rate. So I, I have quite a few more questions. Are you still ready? So, oh, oh somebody yeah. said that, somebody did say 44 degrees Celsius is, uh, or centigrade is 111 Fahrenheit. Oh. So. Thank you, Melinda. Really? I have got time for, for, for two more questions. Two more? Okay, so uh, there's two questions. Or, or, yeah, which penguin is the most endangered today? Okay, so you have, uh, there are like four categories. The most, like the endangered species are the more uh, endangered, right? And uh, so I would say that co in considering the, the uh, conservation status in danger and the population size, I would say the, um, the, um, the rarest penguin species are the, Af the, sorry, the, the Galapagos penguin with less than 2,000 pairs. 
The yellow-eyed penguin, the population is less than 1,700 pairs, but also there is a big concern with the African because the population collapsed from over 1 million 100 years ago to less than 20,000 pairs now. So it's not only the size, but also the trend, you know? So those, those three would be the most concerning. Okay, okay. So um, I guess the, uh, the other question was how many extinct type of penguins? You kind of answered that as well, um, I guess. Yeah. Um, somebody said they're curious about their feet. I'm not sure what she's asking, but yeah. In, in terms of the extinct number of penguins, there are a lot. <laughs> like <laughs> Africa used to have five wow. penguin species, but they were isolated on islands. And then with, with the change in the levels, uh, in the level, in the sea, in the level of the sea, those islands were connected uh, to the continent. So the predators, uh, you know, that was oh. natural selection. So they only have one right now. So depend depending on the moment of the evolution, we had different different numbers of penguins. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. Do we have time? Do we have any other questions out there? Oh, somebody said they're curious about the structure of the feed. If you want to take on that that question. Um, okay. Yeah. So the the one mention one thing that I remember. Like, <laughs> I think it's interesting, you know, like uh, seabirds and penguins that live on very cold temperature, you know, very cold environments, they try, they have a strategy not to lose the body temperature because it costs a lot of energy. So when the body, uh, this is hard to explain in English, I'm sorry. When the, <laughs> when the warm blood goes down into the, into the, um, the feet, they have the structure of the veins, you know, and, and capillars. It is such a structure that the, the heat that comes down goes into, the, goes into the blood that is, the cold blood that is coming up. So the temperature of the feet, it's lower than the body temperature. So you know what I mean? It's like keeping your house warm, not having the windows open all the time and burning, burning you know, logs to keep it warm. So they, uh, it's like they shut the windows. <laughs> so in that, in that sense, they, you know, reduce the waste of energy uh, and the waste of heat, you know? I don't know if that was clear enough. <laughs> and, and, and also then avoid a, a, a cold shock to their core as that yeah. uh, blood comes back up. But this has been really uh, wonderful, uh, a, a chance to, to meet with you. We are really grateful to you for spending some time with us today and also um, more so for the work that you are doing in um, conservation and preservation of species and, and the habitats that they, they, they live in. Um, the, uh, um, Melinda, could you put the link to um, the website for uh, making a donation to, to to, to, to Pablo uh, again, and if, if you're considering, I know some people sometimes make a donation to support me um, in these, these workshops and my, my family does greatly appreciate that. But today what I would like you to consider is that if you would, are thinking of making a, a, a donation, please first consider uh, one that will go to these guys, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the, because that, um, it, uh, with, through, through Pablo is a way that we can really sort of help with that conservation and, and, and protection. Um, again, we're very grateful um, to the, the work that you are doing. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, Marsha, tell everybody um, how to, to, to find you. And if you want to learn about, uh, listen to the interview on uh, Be Provided Conservation Radio or hear interviews with um, other great conservationists around the globe, um, how can people find that? Yeah, so you can find me on my website. It's uh, beprovided.com. And I have all the interviews linked there. They're also on iTunes. If you do a search on iTunes, you can do Be Provided Conservation Radio. And um, yeah, on my webpage, it's nice because I share photos and show notes. Like I interviewed Jack and I have some of his pictures and we had a great interview. It was a lot of fun a couple years ago. Um, so yeah, you get to get like a little background story on the website of, of the people I'm talking to. And this is just a passion project for me to share 
work that you guys are doing and uh, share it with the world and hopefully get more interest involved. So yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. So, yeah, so I want to encourage people to, to find that podcast, subscribe to it um, and, uh, and, and share that with friends. It's a really great way to get to know about work that, that people just like us around this globe are doing together to, to make a difference. Um, and uh, again, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate you being with us. To all of our nature journaling friends, we appreciate you being with us today. We hope that this was a really valuable workshop, um, both that you got some drawing tips and some inspirations about ways that we as human beings can work together to protect and preserve this beautiful planet that we live on. Thank you all and have a really good day.